Jeremiah chapter 18. Hello, everybody. Uh, grab your Bible, whatever version of the Bible that you want to read, if you want to follow along. Um, I'll be reading out of the New Living Translation, but any Bible that you want to read, if you want to follow, go ahead and grab it. Chapter 18. This is a quick little reading. The Potter and the Clay. The Lord gave another message to Jeremiah. He said, go down to the potter shop and I will speak to you there. So I did as he told me and found the potter working at his wheel, but the jar he was making did not turn out as he had hoped. So he crushed it into a lump of clay again and started over. Then the Lord gave me this message. Oh, Israel, can I not do to you as this potter has done to his clay? As the clay is in the potter's hand, so you are in my hand. If I announce that a certain nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down and destroyed, but then that nation renounces its evil ways, I will not destroy it as I had planned. And if I announce that I will plant and build up a certain nation or kingdom, but then the nation turns to evil and refuses to obey me, I will not bless it as I said I would. Therefore, Jeremiah, go and warn all Jude and Jerusalem. Say to them, this is what the Lord says. I am planning disaster for you instead of good. So turn from your evil ways, each of you, and do what is right. But the people replied, don't waste your breath. We will continue to live as we want to, stubbornly following our own evil desires. Makes me so mad. So this is what the Lord says. Has everyone, anyone ever heard of such a thing? Even among the pagan nations, my virgin daughter Israel has done something terrible. Does the snow ever disappear from the mountaintops of Lebanon? Do the cold streams flowing from those distant mountains ever run dry? But my people are not so reliable, for they have deserted me. They burn incense to worthless idols. They have stumbled off the ancient highways and walk in muddy paths. Therefore, their land will become desolate, a monument of their stupidity. All who pass by will be astonished and will shake their heads in amazement. I will scatter my people before their enemies as the east winds scatter dust. And in all their trouble, I will turn my back on them and refuse to notice their distress. A plot against Jeremiah. Then the people said, come on, let's plot a way to stop Jeremiah. We have plenty of priests and wise men and prophets. We don't need him to teach the word and give us advice and prophecies. Let's spread rumors about him and ignore what he says. Lord, hear me and help me. Listen to what my enemies are saying. Should they repay evil for good? They have dug a pit to kill me. Though I pleaded for them and tried to protect them from your anger. Jeremiah is the only one praying for these people. They have no consideration of trying to turn back to God. It is only Jeremiah pleading to them to the real true God and really trying to get them back to his holy word. And Jeremiah was a prophet during Josiah's time. Josiah was the king that when they found the law of the Lord in the temple, they reread it and realized how far they were from God. And here we are still so distant. And to my limited understanding, I think that the book of Jeremiah is not necessarily in strict chronological order. So it's hard to know when exactly this is happening. But these people should know God. These are God's chosen people. How wonderful it is to be a chosen child of God. God has a special love for the people of Israel. And they aren't even trying to live for him at all. It is only Jeremiah praying for them. And these people are plotting to kill Jeremiah. So just because you treat people very well and you live for the Lord... It might not necessarily mean that you will be loved or honored or cared for. That's why we have to do things for God and not for our own desires and, and ego and pride. That will just drift us further away. So Jeremiah is yet again a wonderful example for us trying to walk by faith. So let their children starve. Let them die by the sword. Let their wives become childless widows. Let their old men die in a plague. And let their young men be killed in battle. Let screaming be heard from their homes as warriors come suddenly upon them. For they have dug a pit for me and have hidden traps along my path. Lord, you know all about their murderous plots against me. Don't forgive their crimes and blot out their sins. Let them die before you deal with them in your anger. And that's the end of chapter 18. I know that was a short one, but we are going to stop there. How interesting that Jeremiah has been praying for them and pleading for them, um, discussing with God how he wants them to have some more mercy and grace than God has already given. And now that they're plotting to kill him, his two cents changes a little bit, doesn't it? Um, but I think so many people read about God's wrath and they said, how can a loving God be so full of wrath and anger? We've got to remember how dangerous sin is, that it's really bad for us. Sin is the disease that we all share and bear together, that only Jesus Christ could pay the atonement for our sins. Only Jesus Christ was capable of bearing the wrath and burden and fury and anger of God. And Jesus did that for us by faith in him. 
But when God hates sin, it's because of how terrible it is for us. Sin separates us from God, even now in the New Testament. And when God gets angry and wrathful, full of judgment and bearing indignation, it's because of how bad sin is for us. And if someone had a disease or a virus or gangrene or cancer, if a good doctor sees that and does nothing about it, it's going to get worse. God sees our disease. He sees the sin and he wants to cut it out because the law of entropy, over time, things tend to decay. They tend to get worse over time. When we don't address our sin at the very root, it will grow into a wild beast and become more and more difficult to manage. When you look back at your life, and I, again, can only speak for myself, but how many times did you make really bad decisions and the standard of bad is God's law? So you stole or you cheated or you manipulated or you took advantage of somebody or you made bad sexual decisions. Honestly, be honest with yourself. Did those things make your life better or did they make your life worse? It's good to see things optimistically and see how God does work all things together for good, even when they're not good things. But most of the time, if you're really honest with yourself, when you sinned, even if you thought it was the right decision at the time, it probably brought your life some negative responses because sin is not good for us. It's nice as we grow and mature and we look back at our life to see the sins that we have committed, that they were not good for us. Use that as a lamp to your future and see sin wasn't good for you in the past. It's probably not going to be good for you in the future. So trust in the Lord and let his word be a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. Um, and again, I'm not um, in any position of authority. So please look to your pastors, look to your uh, spiritual leaders, read Bibles and commentaries, grow in richness and love and wisdom of the Lord. And for no reason other than that, it will serve you and it will serve your relationship with God. And there's no better relationship to fuel than that one. So God is good. And thank you for putting up with my rambles. And um, goodbye, friends. With all my love and heart, I pray to see you soon. Bye-bye.